Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show. It's coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody. Super welcome. It's great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. I am so excited about the show today. I'm really thrilled. You know, Scott's going to be joining me here. Scott Creighton in a, in a hot second. Uh, but we're going to be talking about something that's a life's work for him. You know, he is an engineer. He travels, like, he explores all the sacred sites. It's been on many shows. He's been on my show before, but he's also been on Ancient Aliens. And you've seen him on this show because if you're me, you're trying to understand in your life, what is the relationship that some of us have to Egypt that we don't know about? Clearly, you're looking at things and we all are in awe about certain life events. And today we're going to talk about the Great Pyramid Void Enigma, the mystery of the Hall of the Ancestors with Scott. We're going to be talking about that. And we've got Benny and Jamie. Jamie's probably throwing up some pictures of this. I want everybody to see the book there. I hope I'm in the frame, Jamie. There we go. And I want to just talk about this. When you're Scott, you have a life that you've dedicated, right? But you also get backlash. You know, he he and I could talk and do a whole show on what happens when you get backlash. We're certainly seeing it play out in the Olympics when athletes are getting backlash. What does backlash mean? That means that in your life, you have ideas and your ideas may not match what the conventional norm is right? There may be some things that you know that you've investigated that you have where you're just pointing to things that are probably a little bit, how should I say it, outside of the realm. Now, why do I say that? Well, 18 years ago, when I decided that we've got to do positive talk radio, we've got to. And, you know, there was one station on the planet that thought that was a good idea positive talk radio. What the heck is that? But along the way, you discover things you don't know about what you don't know. Today, we're going to talk about what happens when out of nowhere, there comes the realization of something, the great pyramid boy. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how Scott leads us through this interesting conversation even why a pyramid. Scott, it's great to have you. Welcome to the show. Hi, Dr. Pat. It's good to be here again after, I think, about maybe about six or seven years. But yeah, oh, no, you gotta you're, come looking back you're looking good. You're looking good. Yeah, you're looking good, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're having a moment right here, aren't we? It's so yeah. good. <laughs> Okay, I've, I want to start out with a really odd question. I, I've been getting ready for the show and I'm reading the book. And I'm thinking to myself, and I'm looking at my home. And if you look at my home, you see artifacts in my home that are just a little bit unusual based on how people know me. And they comment about this. But here we are today. You have dedicated yourself to this. You have talked about this. We're talking about the big void today. But I want to ask you this question, you know, what is it about your journey, the knowing that you've had that has brought you the most criticism in presenting your ideas? Oh, gosh, Um, where do I begin? Um, (laughs) I love this question. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's not an odd question at all. It's um, it's a very... um, 
um, pertinent and prescient um, question, um, to be honest, because uh, there isn't really a day that goes by um, where, you know, my thoughts and ideas, views, opinions um, are attacked. And why do people feel that the need to always go on the attack. Yeah. That, that really um, mystifies me personally. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of have changed my sort of thinking um, over the years because when people used to give me a lot of flack and used to um, attack um, my ideas, my theories, I used to knee-jerk myself and try automatically to defend everything that every single word that I said, I tried to defend it. I've realized that actually that's pointless because the people that generally are giving you the flack and are, and are attacking you aren't interested in yeah. what you have to say anyway. So yeah. I soon realized that, well, you know, <laughs> there's, there's no point in me even trying to, um, um, you know, convert you around or whatever, because that's it. These people, um, these people that attack my opinions. Now, I'm not insisting that what I am saying is the real deal. This is as you have to believe this. Absolutely not. And I would never do that. Um, I put it out there for people to, you know, it's an idea, it's an opinion, you know, to, to contemplate over it, to think about it. Does this make sense to you? Um, but the people um, that go on the attack, um, they're not interested in um, having their mind expanded, really, yeah. um, they're, they're, they just seem set in their ways. And, you know, the way it's been is the way it always will be. You know, I, I kind of liken it to, to, to evolution in a sort of way where you have, um, you, know, um, you know, these um, ecosystems and, um, you know, you have um, these ecological niches where a particular species will defend itself yes. you know, to the death and prevent any new competitors coming into that space. Yes. Well, to me, that is a bit like um, Egyptology, you know, and um, the guardians, they are the guardians, the custodians of, um, you know, our ancient history and prehistory up to a point, um, particularly from, from my point of view, when it comes to the Great Pyramids. They are prehistorical, not historical monuments. Anyway, they are the custodians of that, and they will, you know, defend and defend and defend their little niche of um, historical niche. So only in time when the evidence becomes overwhelming, when the competition becomes too great, will they be removed and replaced within that niche. So that's kind of how I see it um, now. It's you know, it's it's a longer game that we have to play yeah. now, basically, you know. Yeah. So. And the reason I wanted to ask you that question, because I really want to dig deep into this now, because in your book, I'm telling you, I love diagrams, right? I love to, I like, I'm like you, I'm like, I love to connect the dots. And what's so brilliant about this, and we're going to, to explain to people what this is, what the void is, but yeah. also from your perspective, the mysteries of the Hall of the Ancestors. And the reason I love this is you have done some beautiful detective work in the book to help us connect the dots. It's not just a conversation about these are the pyramids, this is this. But what you do is you go through the legends of this and you explore, you know, for us thousands of years, right? And you put together science, you put together esoteric traditions, and you present something to us, which is really what I love in the detective work you do. But for people that are not familiar with what we're talking about, let's give them a sneak peek. If you're thinking about Scott, you're thinking about what has been built here, let's just start with the conversation about the pyramids because many people know know of them they know about they exist and they know that they are probably one of the most studied uh, uh, archaeological aspects of who we are and what we do except for the people that are trying to find atlantis <laughs> but we are looking at these pyramids and we have been in awe of them 
tell us about the awe we have and you know what we're talking about when we're talking about Egyptian legend. Yeah. Well, as you know, um, Dr. Pat, all of us um, from our uh, junior school have been taught that the pyramids were the tombs of the pharaohs and that the tomb was the structure, if you like, the machine, if you like, that allowed the pharaoh to ascend to the afterlife. That is what we are taught at school. Now, I remember being at school and I must have been a nerd or something or a geek or something at school, you know, because well, all the other sort of um, kids were interested in dinosaurs and blah, and all that kind of stuff. I was fascinated with the pyramids, always have been. I just could not get my head round because I saw from a very young age just how vast the Great Pyramid was. You know, it's absolutely enormous, nearly 500 feet high, you know, and um, about 750 feet wide. You know, so I'm looking at this thing and I'm thinking, why did they build that for just one guy as his eternal tomb? Because, you know, that thing could be seen you know, if, if they built that to protect his body, it could be seen from like 40 miles away. Yeah. You know, so that didn't make any sense to me. Right. You know, <laughs> why, why would they do that? If it's about protecting the king's body, you know, uh, you know, um, just as, you know, anyway, that, 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 that really didn't make, make sense because you have these passages that basically lead directly to the so-called burial chamber. So it made no sense to me whatsoever. Not very protected. Not at all. I mean, yeah. um, you know. So there's a disconnect. Yeah, totally. The, the pyramid, um, the lower chamber of the Great Pyramid has always been accessible since it was built. Has always been accessible. Now, why would a king even permit that to happen? He just would not do that. You know, so you find all these anomalies, you know, as you get older and you start investigating, you find all these, these, these anomalies. Um, about the, the internal architecture of the Great Pyramid. But then as well, you know, I started researching um, about the legends of the pyramids. Because what these legends tell us is a completely different story yeah. as to why they were built from what we were taught at school. Now, these legends come from the ancient Egyptians themselves, or rather their descendants. The Coptic Egyptians, who represent about 10% of the modern Egyptian population today, they held on to these traditions for thousands of years. And they tell us and themselves that they are the custodians of the ancient Egyptian civilization and that they preserve the cultural heritage of the ancient Egyptian civilization. Now, the, why did the, these were oral traditions that were passed down by the Coptic Egyptians, which is kind of strange because ancient Egypt was one of the world's first literate societies. So why would the Coptic Egyptians revert to um, an oral tradition? Well, the reason for that, um, um, there's a Coptic Egyptian professor, um, Fatin uh, Gurgis, who tells us, she, she did a brilliant dissertation paper um, her doctorate, and she tells us that well, the cop, the cop, or the Egyptian civilization was invaded three times in antiquity by the Macedonians, the Romans, and then latterly the the Arabs, and all these consequences, you know, they had they were brutal persecutions basically, and they were not allowed to have any of their history, their written history. It was all destroyed, so they had to revert to the oral tradition to preserve their history. And one of the legends that they preserved is the legend of Saurid or Surid. Now, he was the king of ancient Egypt, Egypt, whom the Coptic Egyptian legend tells us built the Great Pyramids. Now, wow. the name Surid is actually, um, the, the scholar Sander Fodor tells us is merely a corruption of the name Sufis. It's a corruption of the, the, the name Sufis. If you look at the Greek name Sufis and the Greek name Surid, they're very close. So it's probably a transcription error. So the name Sufis is really the name we're talking about. And we know that Sufis translate into Egyptian Khufu. So this is, this is where we're at. The, the Coptic legends tell us that Saurid Khufu built the Great Pyramid. 
not as his tomb, but as um, basically what happened was the legend tells us that he saw something changing in the heavens. And he asked his astronomer priests at the time, what does this mean? And they told him it means in about 300 years time, about 300 years time, there will be a great deluge that will destroy the entire kingdom. Everything wow. will be destroyed. Wow. So Khufu then decided that what he would do was to build these man-made mountains that we know as pyramids and into which he would place everything that the kingdom would need afterwards um, to reboot itself, essentially, inside these ch the chambers within these monuments. Now, we built about 16 of these, hmm. okay? And this, this number, 16 pyramids, which I explain in the book as well, is allegorical to the 16 pieces of Osiris. Or Osiris's body was cut yeah. into 16 pieces scattered across the land of Egypt. Now, the pyramid texts tell us that Osiris is the pyramid, the pyramid is Osiris, and there's just 16 pieces of the legend of Osiris. So these 16 pyramids were essentially vaults or arcs. And if you look at the early Christian tradition, you know, the, the, the homilies um, of, you know, we know of the origin, origins homilies, they tell us that the pyramid, that the ark was shaped as a pyramid. You know, so and there's there's some depictions in medieval art of the the ark as a pyramid with all these animals coming out of it. You know, so we have this ancient tradition that goes back that the pyramids were essentially arcs, and that is what the legend of Surat essentially tells us that he was building arcs so that his kingdom, after the worst effects of this flood had abated, that the kingdom would be able to recover, would be able to reboot itself. They are recovery vaults. That's what I call them. Wow. I, this is so fascinating. But, you know, one of the things, too, that I'm really struck by and the way you describe this, Scott, in the book is, I mean, you don't leave much out. You even talk about the fact that the Great Pyramid of Giza, you often talk about the electromagnetic energy through the yeah. hidden. Okay, so... This is where I get like super like excited about it. Electromagnetic energy in the hidden chambers. Now, this has been, you know, a headline that has come out since 2018, you know, and there is a perception in mainstream of view of the pyramids, which you're talking about and helping us understand. But yet yeah, we know, maybe let me just generalize for a moment. I don't like doing that, but I like to generalize on this. I'm not sure there are many people that have heard about the pyramids or even seen pictures are not in awe. And I don't just mean awe in a logical way, but there's something so esoteric about the, the awe. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, yes, yeah, so if you're an architect, you're like, ooh, this is like architecturally. Uh, if you're an archaeologist, then there's like an awe. But there's another awe. There's a collective Ah, that there's something greater than a bunch of stones stones being piled together. I want to talk about that in the context of how wrong the mainstream view is, but also how right the mainstream yeah. sense is. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this feeling, I mean, I've been to Giza and, mm -hmm. you know, um, the Great Pyramid um, several times. And the sense that you get when, you were talking earlier, Dr. Pat, you were talking yeah. earlier about people, you know, um, looking for a sense of identity of, yeah. of, of, you know, at a personal level in their lives, yeah? Yeah. And who they are, you know, they'll maybe research their, their, their ancestors, their roots a little bit, but they can only get so far. But yeah. they, feel there's some, they feel there's something more to them, you know, searching their own ancestry. Yeah. And, um, you know, they want to connect to something. Well, I feel the same thing um, with history. You know, I look at these structures and I know that, I know, I, get, I just get the sense of ancientness 
of the place. And that, in a sense, that, that takes me back to the ancient roots of mankind in general, not just me as an individual. It connects me um, to our ancient past, you know, as, as, as a human species. You know, this, this is us, you know, yeah. going way, way, way back. You know, so in a sense, you know, when I when I'm at those monuments, I, I feel connected to some, yeah. you know, ancient roots. If if I can maybe put it like that, it, it, it's just that 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 gives me a, a sort of inner sense of connectedness when when I'm at those monuments. It's just I. I don't know if I'm articulating this particularly no, it, well. No, it's exactly right. But the reason I want to ask that question, and I want to talk about how we how we get to not only the many, many things you've done and written about this and talked about, but this particular book, because um, when I think about this discovery, and I'm talking about the Great Pyramid Void, void we're going to get to that now, right? Yep. The enigma of that, even for those of us that, briefly have a sense of anything about this it's it's like a what you know we're like what but people the scientists you right your body of work your lifetime you're like me you're like what about this um i want to do this benny we have three copies of the great pyramid void enigma the mystery of the hall of ancestors um and you know this is as we're talking about this, this is a book we'd like to give away three copies. I'd love to do that now as Scott and I are going to continue to chat. 1-800-930-2819. And I know Jamie's putting up pictures on Facebook. There it is. Love it. Um, Scott, how do people find out about you? Let's get over. Let's get everybody to find out about you because we're just talking about one aspect of Scott, but there's like a lot of aspects of Scott. Okay, well, my publishers, I'm sure you know, um, yeah. is Inner Traditions and yeah. Bear and Company. So I've got a, a, a sort of holding page there on Inner Traditions website where Beautiful. people can find out a little bit more about mm -hmm. myself and my, and my books. You know, I, I, I always like to um, you know, ask people to support their local bookstores. So yeah. if you can do that, do that. Um, you know, I, I have um, an, an online forum on, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the name, I, I can say ATS. Yeah, um, yeah. you can yeah, say above, the name. Yeah, abovetopsecret.com. I've got the alternative um, Egyptology um, forum um, on there. So people are welcome to pop in, you know, start a topic and I'll be glad to um, answer any questions. And please go ahead and take a look at this. Um, all right. There is in this void, there is, how should I say it? When I take the information about what everyone is, was just in like, we didn't see this coming. Talk about for a minute and then we'll connect the dots, you know, as we talk about the King's Chamber and also we talk about the angle of certain things. But this was like one of these events, Scott, right? Where all of you are like, what? <laughs> Can you talk about the surprise of the void and what this has come to mean now? Well, yeah. You see, the thing is, when you look at um, the very first pyramids, first um, uh, 16, 20 or so pyramids, what you find is that there's between one and, say, a maximum of three chambers. That's it. Most of them have maybe one, two chambers, most of them. Um, some of them have, have uh, I think, like the, the Red Pyramid and the Bent Pyramid have three chambers. And these can all be more or less explained in terms of um, conventional, all these different chambers and their purposes can be more or less explained. Um, obviously, one of them is the burial chamber, but well, the so-called burial chamber. But then we have the Great Pyramid, which has this massive chamber called the Grand Gallery, a fourth chamber. And to be honest, Egyptologists today, I mean, they've known about that chamber forever, you know, well, since at least, um, I don't know, Al Mamun broke in in about 820 AD. So they've known about that for about 1200 years, but they've never really been able to explain it in terms of their Egyptological understanding. Um, it's just there and they call it some grand processional chamber or you know, something like that. They, they, they don't really know how that chamber 
fits in. That's four chambers in the big in the Great Pyramid. So already the Great Pyramid is slightly cast adrift from all the other pyramids that have come before. And now, now we find potentially another massive chamber, the same size as the Grand Gallery. Now, just to let your listeners understand, Dr. Pat, yeah. the, Grand, the Grand Gallery is about um, 10 feet wide, 30 feet high, and about 100 feet long. Yeah, it's, it's shocking to even think about this for me. This you know, is like huge. totally mind blowing. Yeah, and that's the fourth chamber in the Great Pyramid. It's massive, absolutely massive. And now what um, the Scan Pyramids team have discovered is a chamber or a space, a big void. They're not calling it a chamber yet because, well, they've never been in there yet. So it's a... <laughs> Just now, it's, uh, they're playing with semantics, really, um, that, in, my, exactly. in my opinion. You know, so there's this massive space that they've now found. It's as big as the Grand Gallery, and that's the fifth chamber. You know, so it's just completely throwing everything, you know, <laughs> up in the air. Yeah, just... and let's talk about what it throws up in the air. It throws up some conceptual ideas that pre previous discoveries and pre previous people that have discoveries and the way they're connecting the dots. I could spend a lifetime just reading one of your articles, right? And trying to interpret the impact because it's so massive to me when you have hundreds of years of people and discoveries, right? people that have been in there that have discovered things you know i think about you know uh gilbert and you know those folks that really just uh, uh you know you know investigated and found things here's my question even though we can't call it a chamber we know it's big right somehow our science has made us discover things we know it's big Here's my question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to go out on a limb if you could. Does this discovery in your, Scott, your perspective, is it going to blow previous analysis out of the water? And what I mean by that is we're looking at connections and we're looking at the Great Pyramid Enigma. We're also looking at the king's chamber, we're looking at the king's chamber, the queen's chamber, we're looking at trajectories, we're looking at Orion, we're looking at these connections, which are just absolutely stunning when you look at them and the connection. And you're thinking to yourself, some future Hollywood person created a movie and the Great Pyramid's a movie. And it's not. This was created by, you can decide if humans created it or not that's another show where you and i can do on that because i'm telling you i don't know any human that could create this i you know maybe there is some maybe i don't know einstein's dead but maybe he come back but i don't know any human maybe uh elon musk i don't know maybe you could create it but can you help me understand how this new discovery may alter evidence that has come before yeah, well, it's, it's kind of slowly already starting to do that. <laughs> However, if um, they do find a means to gain access, and I've heard from a source that they are trying to um, um, drill into that space, when they get in there, and if they find in there what I suspect they will find in there, then it is going to change the paradigm completely and overnight, in my opinion, because it will prove, if they find in this chamber, what I suspect will find in this chamber, because what I suspect they'll find, I, it's not me saying this, it's the Coptic Egyptian legend that's telling us what's in this chamber. Exactly. It's not me saying this. So if they find in there, if they start listening to the Coptic Egyptian people and what they're saying, and rather instead of believing what, you know, some person made up a couple of hundred years ago, yep. you know, and start li properly listening to what yep. 
these people are saying, then, you know, it's really going to come as a big shock to them. And it's going to change yep. things overnight. It yep. really is. I agree with you. I, I so agree with you that I can't wait till they put the Dead Sea Scrolls together because, you know, we're talking about if we really pay attention, right, of what was said, it will change not only our perspective. Now, look, we've got Bob calling in from Australia. Let's go to Bob. Bob, it's question, Benny, if we could. Welcome to the show, Bob. Hi, hey, Bob. You're live. Hey. Hey, how are you today? Hey, can you hear me okay? Uh, beautifully. Question we got for Scott, right? Yeah. There's a there's a bit of a delay because I'm in the Whitsunday Islands in Australia. And and um, yeah, Scott, I've been fascinated by the pyramids ever since I was a young fellow and I'm 68 now. And I went there in 74 and just wandering you know, through the area like the hairs on the back of my neck standing up and the, the same energy that I felt as um, at um, Stonehenge. Um, but I came across a guy, Hakim Awiyam, who was a Suf elder, who did some great presentations on the purpose and history of the, the pyramids. And, you know, what's coming to light now is just amazing. For me, as an engineer, um, well, trained as an engineer, um, for me, it's obvious what they were. You know, they are energy generators um, connected through a global grid to other megalithic structures around the planet. And even the, the walls in the, the great chambers, when they opened them up, they were all blackened as if there'd been some great sort of energy happening mm -hmm. there, some sort of fusion or fission, I don't know. Um, but um, the Egyptian, you know, the, the Egyptologists at the time cleaned all that muck off the walls. It's just another way of hiding the truth. But I love the way the truth is now coming out, you know. And it's it's so obvious that the pyramids, they say, you know, well, were built about two and a half, three thousand 3,000 years BC. But no, I reckon they just had a makeover, you know. They just had a bit of a refurbishment. I yeah. so love for us to be able to re-energize the pyramids. That oh. would be my goal. I'd love to see that happen. Wow. Wow, Scott. Are we yeah. getting closer to doing that? <laughs> um, well, as I said, my source at the moment uh, tells me that, um, you know, there's scientists up there in um, Campbell's chamber, which is uh, way, way, way above the King's chamber. It's that sort of, chamber with the sort of um, inverted V roof, the vaulted um, roof. And from what I've been told, and um, it's not official, it's not, you know, um, but my source tells me that they're, they're currently drilling a small hole through the vaulted roof up in Campbell's chamber to um, then uh, push an endoscopic camera um, through the hole into the big void space to try and um, have an initial look look around yeah. because you know the, the thing about the big void space dr pat is that there's absolutely no passageways to it there's no tunnels or passageways or anything it's just sitting there completely isolated from the rest of the pyramid and that's the other thing that kind of makes the egyptologists think well oh, hey that can't be a chamber because there's no passages to it, you know. No, it's a chamber and it serves a very, very specific function. But, you know, regarding um, Bob's ideas, I mean, I've heard these ideas about, you know, the, the, the energy grid and so forth and so on. You know, the, I think, you know, Graham Hancock talks about this a lot, that there was, you know, a, a pre-ice age civilization that understood a lot about a planet and, you know, basically, um, you know, they could, you know, travel across our planet, you know, they could go to the Americas, they could go to Egypt, they could go to Stonehenge, they could go to all these places around the world, you know, they mapped the world, we have got ancient maps you know, from ancient times, you know, when, um, you know, the longitude wasn't known. And, you know, these maps have the longitude on them, which, you know, we didn't discover until John Harrison, you know, invented a, a timepiece that was accurate enough for us 
to, um, to, to use longitude. So, but here it is in these ancient maps, you're like, there has to have been an ancient civil, and these maps are using other ancient yeah. sources, source maps that have since disappeared. Um, probably when the Library of Alexandria was burned down, a whole lot of stuff disappeared. But you know, um, so this idea that, you know, th this civilization, you know, you know, we do know that there are energy lines, there are ley lines, you know, there's a ton of evidence about this. Is that why they selected that particular location um, in, <laughs> in Egypt um, to build the pyramids? I don't know, maybe that, that is one of the reasons. But it is an absolute um, fact, you know, there's been scientific studies done that so I think the Times article in 2018 shows that the Great Pyramid um, or the pyramid shape focuses, but particularly the Great Pyramid focuses um, electromagnetic energy into the chambers. You know, its design focuses energy, electromagnetic energy into the actual chambers. Now, the thing about, and, and here's the other interesting thing right. about electromagnetic, electromagnetism, it slows down decay. Electromagnetism slows down decay. And I've done all sorts of experiments. I think I've got one experiment in the in the book, the, the milk experiment. I'm not sure if you've read that, Dr. Pratt, but yeah. you know, it, it shows they did tests with pyramids, you know, and they placed an eight-sided pyramid over you know, one beaker of milk and a four-sided yes. pyramid and diff, diff, different types of pyramids, and they left a you know, a sort of test um, pyramid with you know, a test beaker with no pyramid, you know, and the eight sided pyramid, you know, preserved the milk the longest and stopped it decaying the most um, over time, you know. And here we have the Great Pyramid as an eight sided pyramid. Yeah. It's yeah. an eight sided pyramid, you know. So it's fascinating to me that that particular shape can minimize decay. And if you've got a lot of bodies in there that you do not want to decay, and this goes back to the ancient Egyptian religion, yes. then, you know, an eight-sided pyramid is the thing you're going to need. Yeah. For that electromagnetism to prevent that decay. Yeah. And, you know, you're absolutely, I mean, you know what you're talking, and yes, I've read that uh, book. I've read that your experiment on that, which is totally fascinating to me, but you always have to get to the next place, Scott, you know, and this is what I love is we get to the next place where we start to ask questions that only human beings could ask. Why? Why? How? And if you go to the why, and I love this about the enigma that you're presenting, the Great Pyramid Void Enigma, the mystery of the Hall of the, uh, of the Ancestors, right, Scott? I'm going to hold the book up, but I'm sure... <laughs> You know, I think this is one of the few shows I do where I take no breaks uh, because I want to talk with you and thank you for referencing, you know, referencing, uh, you know, the idea of, you know, uh, Giza as sort of a power plant, sort of the references of this. But one of the things you talk about in the book and the diagrams that I love you talk about in the book is you bring us on the journey where we're looking at, we're looking at a, a, a line, we're looking at maybe a set of relationships, G1, G2, G3, Orion's belt. We're looking at some things that are so precise in their determination, so precise that people like we can map these things out, right? that we can see this and it's fascinating about these events talk from your perspective and what you've got in the book will we get clarity from this new void will we get clarity from this new void or see because i don't think we're done yet i think there's a whole lot more going on in the great pyramid I know just me, I'm not Liu. I don't study this for like a living. I don't, you know, but my sense is there's a lot more. Well, Do you think we'll get a sense of clarity from this or will we have to rethink some things, Scott? Well, in a, in a sense, Dr. Pratt, um, I hope we don't get clarity. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because everyone loves a mystery, you know. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. 
I, I will probably get attacked even more for taking all the mystery out of things, you know. So, yeah, me too. I'm with you on that. You know, so it's it's a kind of um, you know a double-edged sword in in a sense. Um, but clarity, I think, um, if we accept what the Coptic Egyptian legends tell us about yeah. these structures, we already have clarity. Yeah, it's we there. do. Mm -hmm. It's there. It's right in their, their texts why they built, or their ancestors built um, these pyramids. And, you know, if you look at the, their religion, the king was more important in the ancient Egyptian religion in death than he was in life. Because in death, the king could intercede with the gods. He could um, commune with the gods to ensure that the Nile would flow, the sun would rise, the crops would grow, the winds would blow, and so on and so forth. That was the job of the dead kings, the Osiris kings. And this is why the mummification had to be so perfect with these dead kings, the Osiris kings, because if their body decayed, then the king's soul, which would go out during the day and then come back to its eternal roost at night and re-enter the body of the king. If the king's body decayed so much, the soul wouldn't be able to recognise the body. Mm. And that would mean that king would die forever. He could no longer commune with the gods. And the potential that happened with every ancestor, then there could be absolute chaos um, in Egypt, the sun wouldn't rise and, you know, the, the kingdom would just die. So that is what they believed. And that is why mummification was so crucial. And, the, you know, um, preventing decay was so crucial um, to, you know, the, the ancient Egyptians or what I call the pre-ancient Egyptians. Yeah. Because I believe this goes way, way back, way, way before 2500 BC. And that's what I, I wanted to ask you about, because yeah. that's really, you know, one of the premises of your work is that it goes way back before that. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. Totally does. There's absolutely no way that those pyramids <clears throat> were built in 2500 BC, in my opinion. Um, I think Bob... Um, from Australia, I think Bob's right in saying that they're they're basically a makeover in 2500 BC. I know they were a makeover in BC in, in, at that time, 2500 BC, because the painted marks that Colonel Weiss found in the chambers, yes. he caught. In my in my opinion, he copied those marks from stones that were repaired on that monument in 2500 BC. How do I know that? Because the orthography of the text of the writing is completely anachronistic to the supposed time of 2500 BC. The orthography of those maps is from a much later period in ancient Egyptian history. It just, so Colonel Weiss, yeah, he thought they were just- Weiss, uh, yes. Yeah, hieroglyphics. So he copied them into these chambers thinking oh, all, all hieroglyphics are the same. Well, we now know they're not. Yeah. And they're from different periods. And that was his big mistake and I explained that um, you explain length. it really interestingly in the book. Yeah. Now, I was looking at the way you explain it in the book, and I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, what is the impact of that? Yeah. It's well, a they, major impact. It's a seriously major impact because what Colonel Weiss did was he essentially placed false evidence. Exactly. In, into these monuments, which basically the Egyptology were they're trundling along, doing a fairly good job, you know, interpreting the hieroglyphics, Champollion and so forth, doing a reasonably good job, Petri, you know, investigating, measuring and so forth and so on. And then they were thrown a curveball by Colonel Weiss, placing this false evidence, which forced even Egyptology, in my opinion, down the wrong path. Had he not done what he did, I believe that the, the Coptic Egyptian narrative that we have may have been given um, a more thorough hearing yeah. than it has. But because essentially um, Colonel Weiss's actions essentially solidified the Tomb of the Pharaoh um, paradigm in the heads of the Egyptologists, it essentially stymied their thinking. They thought, well, right, that's it. You know, it's a done deal now. Well, they're fake. Those marks 
in my opinion, I present a ton of evidence, not just in this book, Dr. Pat, but I've done a whole Other book. Books. Yeah, yeah the, the Great Pyramid Hoax. My previous book has got a ton of evidence, new evidence that's never before been seen um, to show um, that those those marks. I mean, I even found Colonel Vice's handwritten diaries, his field notes from his time in Egypt in 1837. And they give, you know, a different story to what his published account gives yeah. us to give us a different story. So are we going to get back on track though, Scott, because yeah. I agree with you because are we going to get back on track with looking at what he did and changing our paradigm? And, and what I mean by getting back on track, that false, I don't even know what to call it. Documentation. <laughs> Let me call it documentation for lack of a better word. Um, we have to really then go back and say this, take it out, and now what do we have? I mean, are we doing that? And what I mean by back on track is back on track to remove something that was falsified and now look with a different lens. You know, are we doing that now or are we still holding on to this information that may not be true at all? Yeah, well, we're not doing it yet, to be honest. Okay. I mean, my, my book and my last yeah. couple of books are just one small step to doing that, you know, to taking us um, out of this current mainstream paradigm, tomb of the king, tomb of the pharaoh paradigm. Yeah. You know, this very simplistic idea. We're, we're a long way from shifting that paradigm and it's going to take, I think, a lot more evidence. I think when they find what's in the big void, that may help shift yeah. things a little bit, but I think yep. I suspect all, all it'll do if they find what I believe they'll find in there, Egyptologists will find a way to just simply shift the goalposts, you know, to say, well, yes, it fits into the, the, the our paradigm because of you know this, this, or this. They'll just move the goalpost to embrace um what I believe they'll find there. You know, so um, it's a gigantic chamber though. Yeah, it's, 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 as I said. It's, I mean, you know, do you have to ask yourself the question if you're like me, a lay person, do you have to ask yourself this lay person type question? What purpose does it serve? It's got to have a purpose. Yeah. It can't be a, just a quote void. You know, I mean, yeah. even though we'd like to say, ah, blah, 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 really nothing. It's just a big I don't know, don't call it a chamber. I don't know what you want to call it. I just call it a big void. But, you know, the fact that it's a big void, you know, it just raises so many more questions to laypersons like me. Yeah, well, Dr. Hawass, Zahi Hawass, whom I know you've probably heard of, and, and Mark Lehner, uh, the American Egyptologist, they are basically, the, the, their first, their initial reaction was, oh, the Great Pyramid is filled with these voids. You know, there's you know nothing to see here, folks. You know, <laughs> move, move along. You know, it's the the Great Pyramid is peppered with these these voids. But well, actually, no, it's not because um, the way the the um, scan pyramid, the muon tomography. This is the the science that yeah. they use to scan the pyramid. The way it works, if a small, if the pyramid is peppered with voids like a Swiss cheese. It, they would be aggregated out. They take an average and all these small voids would just be aggregated out. The technology wouldn't see anything, it only sees big spaces. That's right. how the technology works. So Dr. Awas and Lenner, now I know for a fact, have changed their tune a little bit. They're now saying, well, you know, we think um, we may find something significant in there. They're now changing or starting to kind of come around to the idea of what this. Um, so I'm hoping maybe they've read some of my articles and, yeah. and, and my book. But um, that explains... send it to them again. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think there are mistakes, you know, in the universe that I live in. I, I really don't think there are mistakes. I don't believe in a in the laws of a universe. I don't even like the word mistakes. I don't think that, I mean, I was talking about it from the Olympics this morning and doing a show. I don't think that there are things that happen that are mistaken. I think there are things that happen to help us connect the dots to get to the bottom line of something, yeah. whether it's our personal lives, you know, yeah. 
I, I, you know, I, I look at my own life and I don't think that losing my job after 25 years was a mistake. I think it was a cosmic rearrangement, you know, for me to get some knowledge and wisdom and do what I was meant to do. But you will keep presenting these things and you have presented so much evidence in this book. There's so I'm just so fascinated by it. Um, I want to make sure folks know, and I know Jamie is making sure people know, I want to make sure they know this is the book. We've given away several copies of it. Um, how do people, again, find out more about you? Because, you know, you're writing articles, I'm reading them. <laughs> Tell <laughs> folks how they can get get more information about you and, so, and sort of join, you know, the conversation with you. Yeah. Okay, well, I've... Uh... You know, as I said, um, you know, they can write to me via the publisher um, in our traditions. They can write to me via the publisher. They can, as I said um, earlier, um, they can go onto my web forum. They go to the main page of abovetopsecret.com and they just scroll down. They'll find um, the Scott Crichton forum. Um, it's, um, uh, probably about two thirds of the way down. So they can scroll down, click on that, and they'll see a whole bunch of um, material that I've written there over, the, I think, since about 2007, about 14 years worth of um, material in there. They can start a topic of their own if they like. They want to add, there's a whole bunch of um, articles on there just now about my new book um, that they can go and read about. Um, it, you know, um, a lot of um, sneak previews of it and so forth that they can go and read up on. Um, there's, um, I was previously, I just finished yesterday, the author of the month on uh, Graham Hancock um, forum. Um, they can go on there and you know read what I've got to say there. So, yeah, um, but if they want to speak to me directly, go on to ATS and, you know, start a topic or if there's a topic there, just, you know, pop a post in there, I'll have a look at it and then um, uh, give you a response. And, and by the way, there are many books by Scott that you can get a hold of, you know, there are so many. Um, <clears throat> I think I've interviewed him on a couple of them, uh, everything from the secret chamber of Osiris, Osiris, uh, Giza prophecy, so much here talking about the Orion Code, and you know you're gonna love when you when you pick up one of Scott's books, you think you're gonna read a bunch of words. Of course, there are the words, but you're going to see how things are connected, how the dots are connected, you know how there are ways that we can look at a sense of understanding, especially if there is this evidence and science that Scott's creating. Scott, thank you so much for today. Um, a couple minutes left. I want to know what do you want to leave us with? What haven't we talked about that you know you want to share with us about these discoveries now? Oh gosh, that's um, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that that that's a toughie. Um, I mean, I'm still um, continue to do research. Um, you know, I've got a, a a couple of things that um, I want to do. Um, I hope to go back to Egypt um, sometime, but you know that 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 may be problematic because it seems that these days anyone with um, alternative ideas is no longer being permitted um, onto these ancient sites. Um, you know, so it, which is an utter disgrace. But anyway, um, you know that's 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 just life, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I would like to um, you know. Um, just keep digging and, and keep researching for answers. That's what I, I do. I do not insist at all that I'm right. It's just ideas, it's just opinions. But as you said, Dr. Pat, I do try to connect everything and I always provide evidence of some kind, whether it's direct evidence or circumstantial evidence um, to back up what it is I'm saying. So it's not just, you know, thrown out there as complete speculation, I always try to back up um, what I say. And that's what I hope to continue to do. Absolutely. Scott, thank you so much for today. Thank you for everything you're doing. It's great to see you again. You too, Dr. Pat. And I hope it's not too long till next time. I hope so as well. Uh, can't wait to see what the next discoveries are, folks, with this. And we are calling it the Great Void until we can call it a chamber. <laughs> let's, take a, let's take a big, it's a big place. It's a big space. It's a lot of square footage. Uh, have you calculated square footage? 
right? Oh, it's God. like 30 oh, by 100. 30 by 100 by 10. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, for, uh, for 10 times 30 is 300 times 400. Yeah, um, yeah. that's yeah. like a giant house. <laughs> massive, absolutely massive, absolutely massive. Oh my gosh, let's take a short break, everybody, we'll be right back. Thank you. 